Hey everybody and welcome back for another lecture review. So with this one we're talking about chapter 2 biological beginnings. So as always we'll start with our learning outcomes. This will tell you what we're going to talk about in chapter 2. Oop, get moving there. But in general what we're going to talk about is how we get from here. So um, you know kind of the sperm and the egg into a fully formed organism. So um, we're going to talk more about the birthing process and upcoming chapters and then infancy. But first we have to talk about, you know, how this kind of process occurs. And, um, you know, I know we all know that it occurs through um, sexual intercourse, but, you know, what is kind of going on that's making this, um, you know, transition happen. Um, I like to call this kind of biology from a psychologist. So I am not a biologist. If you've had um, a lot of biology based courses, this will very much be review for you. If it's been a while since you've had bio courses, then you know, this is kind of just skimming the surface of what we need to know for psychology. So it's not super in depth. Um, you know, chapter two doesn't go super in depth either. It's just kind of what we need to know to understand a little bit about human behavior. So this evolutionary perspective, um, really with evolution, we're talking more of the survival of the fittest. So the best adapted individuals survive and reproduce. But um, our lifespan theorists say that the benefits conferred by evolution decrease with age. So it's really kind of that survival to be able to reproduce, to have the, um, the children. And uh, then, you know, after that, we kind of see that um, our cultural needs kind of become um, greater as we go across our lifespan. So the evolutionary need needs become lower, cultural needs become, or the oppressive culture becomes stronger. So we've already reproduced, we've already survived to that, to that level, and so evolution means a little less to us. Um, so psychology and evolution, um, the big things with evolution here is um, it does not dictate behavior. So there are evolutionary psychologists who study evolution and psychology in tandem, but in general, we really don't think that, you know, evolution dictates what you're going to do. So we'd say, oh, you know, um, I hear people say sometimes, well, you can't blame a man for cheating. It's just evolution or something. It's like, well, it doesn't really dictate behavior. You can choose to not cheat on people. You know, it's not... Um, not, not a given. Um, also, evolution occurs on a time scale that we can't really study very well. So this is long-term change, and so it's, you know, a lot of times we're just looking back and making guesses as to why we think things occurred, but it's really hard for us to actually manipulate and um, examine that change over time because it's such a long time scale. So what we're going to talk about now is kind of the DNA and the genes. So again, this is biology from a psychologist. So if you've had a lot of it, you know, um, this will be very much review. But we have human life beginning as a single cell. So the DNA, we've kind of got this. Um, I like this little picture here because we've got the show the chromosomes that are all wrapped up like a sweater. Someone is unraveling it and you're getting these strands of DNA. And then in there, you can see um, one's genes. And so the gene um, inheritance is what's really important to psychologists. So with these, these are the biochemical instructions. Um, I've got some videos down here. If you really don't remember any of these terms, um, those can help a little bit. Um, the chromosomes, we're getting 23 from mother's 46 and um, 23 from father's 46. In general, then we get a um, fully functioning organism with um, you know, autosomes and sex chromosomes. So I say in general because it doesn't always work that we end up with just 23 from mom, 23 from dad, and a fully functioning organism. We can have um, chromosomal deletion or addition. We can have all kinds of different kinds of things happen, but in general, this is what we see. And um, so males then would be genetically XY, females genetically XX. Again, this is not a given, you know, but that's generally what we see. Um, alleles, though, we get one of two versions of a gene. And so um, for things like blue eyes or eye color, you know, this is pretty easy to see, um, you know, how this would work out. So you might have done this in um, high school where you see, you know, dad has brown eyes, mom has blue eyes, and then you put them in the little chart and you just determine, you know, okay, well, what kind of eyes is baby going to have? So if, um, you know, this person would be homozygous here, they have the same alleles. Um, different would be heterozygous, so like a capital B, lowercase b. Um, if they're dominant, then they're written in big letters. So a capital B for this case would be dominant, and these are recessive. So if we were to label this person, we'd say homozygous because they're the same, and recessive because it's written in small letters. So our genotype-phenotype difference. With genotype, this is what's actually inside. So if we were to pull your blood, if Oprah was to give us some um, of her blood, we could see that her genotype would be whatever it is. But with phenotype, what we have to do is just look at the outside and make guesses as to what's inside. So um, it's not only the genotype then, it's also whatever outside influences have impacted that person. So for Oprah, I bet she's had some um, hair coloring done. So it's probably not her phenotype instead what we're, or it's probably not her genotype, it's probably not 
you know, the exact inherited genes. Instead, we might be seeing some hair treatments or some lightening or coloring there. So it's an environmental influence. So if we want to see what's truly in a person, we need the blood, the genotype. Otherwise, what we're looking at is phenotype. So a lot of things that people are interested in are single gene inheritance. This isn't really true of psychology, though. Most of the things that psychologists are interested in are not single gene inheritance. But this is sickle cell. And so with this one, you've got um, both parents then are heterozygous here. So we've got one dominant, one recessive allele. We can chart this out and see what the children are likely to have. And um, so we have one out of four chance then of having a homozygous um, recessive here. So the same and then recessive, small letters. And this person then would have sickle cell disease. Um, so some other genetic disorders, the two recessive, we just saw sickle cell. Dominants are much less common because um, typically then people don't live to reproduce and have that pass through the gene chain. Um, but Huntington's is an example of that. Other times we can see the chromosomes just don't um, function correctly, so we either get an addition or deletion. Trisomy 21 is Down syndrome, so you, get, you, know, you can see this um, 21st, instead of being a pair here, we've got three, so it's an addition, extra chromosome. Um, so we have all different kinds of ways this, uh, this stuff can happen. Um, I love this little frog moving here. But sexual reproduction, though, is truly advantageous. So the fact that we combined two unrelated parents that have different genetic structures and make one new organism is extremely valuable. If um, you, you know, had a child with your brother as a, as a woman, you know, a sister and a brother having a child together, there's not a lot of a genetic variability there because they share parentage. And so anything that would have killed off the sister then could kill off the brother. But the fact that we typically make pairings from people we don't know, different genetic structures, what takes one person out may not take their partner out, therefore that um, offspring is hardier. So yay for sexual reproduction. So when we study heredity, psychologists are very interested in twins. I've mentioned that before. So they're interested in twins because twins both share an environment and they don't um, share an environment. So you've got maybe living in the same house but different classroom teachers or different, you know, one's in band and one's in PE or whatever. So they've got unique environment, they've got shared environment. Monozygotic twins are the ones who are identical. Dizygotic are fraternal. Twins are um, very, very interesting to psychologists then because they allow us to see, especially with these mono psychotic twins, how much of it is the environment and how much of it is um, the genetic structure. So we love studying twins. Very, very interesting. There we go. Um, and then another thing that um, psychologists really are interested in is studying things like adoption. So, whoops, too far. <laughs> so if you've got a child here, this child is adopted, it shares um, it, they, excuse me, they share genes with their biological parents, and they also share the environment then with their adoptive parents. And so we'll have, um, you know, assuming, like my sister is, is adopted. She was placed into my family when she was six days old. So she did not have a lot of shared environment with her biological parents. Um, that was, you know, five days. And so we can kind of see then, is she more like her biological parents in some ways, or is she more like her adoptive parents? And that lets us kind of tease out this um, nature nurture idea. I'm keep pressing the wrong button there. So genes and psychology. The big thing with genes and psychology is that psychological traits are complex. We cannot just, you know, take your, your genes and then be like, oh, look, here's a gene for being an introvert. So this person's an introvert. Or here's a gene for being an alcoholic. I kind of wish we could because that would be really simplistic and easy. We would understand behavior, but that's not true for us. And so what we end up instead with is polygenic inheritance. And so it's the interaction then of many genes that kind of give someone a predisposition to, be, to have certain behavior or certain characteristics. So it's this activity is affected uh, by the environment and then leads to the propensity for a developmental trajectory. So um, maybe your genetics lead you to be more susceptible to alcoholism. You're in an environment where alcohol is freely available and easy to get. And so then this is putting you on a trajectory towards alcoholism. So we've got the genetics in the environment. Um, this is a really important term as well, just epigenetic view. And with this, what people are, or what researchers are talking about is that the genes in the environment interact. So they even call it a G by E interaction, gene by environment. And so instead of one simply influencing the other, there's an interaction between both of these factors that can exist through the whole lifespan. So we can measure variation in DNA, measure aspects of the environment, and then actually plot this interaction to understand something like alcoholism. And we're able to kind of see and tease apart how much of its genes, how much of its environment, and then, you know, how do these interact with each other? This down here is a really interesting YouTube video. It's about a little rat who, um, you know, just kind of shows how this uh, epigenetics really helps us to understand how changes that can happen in the father can be reflected in the son. 
So it's really, really interesting. Um, but epigenetics is something we'll come back to, and it's um, more related to psychology than maybe a um, simplistic kind of square of single gene inheritance. So heredity environment correlations, there's a bunch of these different kinds. Um, so this li list three here. So with the passive, this is just saying children inherit the techniques or the tendencies from their parents. Uh, parents provide an environment that matches their own tendencies. So if you've got parents who are really musically inclined, they may bring you up with lots of music in the environment. You just happen to be musically inclined yourself. Evocative is the children has a genetic tendency and then they kind of elicit that stimulation from their own environment. So their genes invoke environmental support. So if you've got a kid that's just really, really happy and smiling, this is how my third child is. He's just so super cheerful, smiles at everybody, waves at everybody. He gets a lot of positive feedback from people, but he evokes that from people because of his own personality. And then this active niche picking. So children will actively seek out things that support and reflect their interests and that are you know really in line with their own genotype. So if you've got um, you know kids that really enjoy, um, for me it was quiet activity, so I would, I like to read, I love to read, I've always read my whole life, and so um, I would seek out then that environmental niche because that was my interest. And so in middle school I would often spend lunch period in the library curled up with a book, you know, shoving little bits of cheese sandwich in because that's what I was um, enjoying. But it was this active choice, I was kind of picking where I fit based on my characteristics and interests and then engaging in that. And then we see now, you know, um, that that's something that's stuck with me for life. I often will be curled up reading somewhere if you give me a few minutes to myself. So it's an active thing that I chose. Um, so this is moving beyond this just a little bit. So we have a couple slides of prenatal diagnostic tests or other things about prenatal life. Uh, in our next chapter, we're going to talk about pregnancy and about, um, you know, the, uh, the fetus. So some diagnostic tests, these are listed in your book and they'll go over kind of a little bit more about what each one is, but ultrasound is what we often think of. So um, this is when we often think of if someone's pregnant, you've probably been to their ultrasounds. Um, they just lay them on the table, they rub that wand across their belly and they're able to see and look into the fetal environment. Um, brain imaging techniques are amazing, so we can actually go in and see parts of the fetal brain. Not everyone will receive some of these other things, so most of the time when you're pregnant, you'll receive an ultrasound at some point in your pregnancy. Um, brain imaging, we only do if there's a reason. Um, CVS would only do too if there's a reason, because they'll actually go in and take a little bit of the... Um, the uh, fetal tissue, and so, um, well, the, the placental tissue, and so we don't want to do that unless we, we need to. Um, amniocentesis, they take a little bit of amniotic fluid, and they're able to look um, and see if there's any issues there. Again, something that not everyone will receive. And with our maternal blood screenings and our non-invasive prenatal diagnoses, so all of these are kind of listed in the book, but generally we can get a lot of information simply from running blood tests from the mom or from having people who are, you know, uh, maternal fetal medicine who specialize in understanding the fetus, kind of looking and seeing what's going on. So there's a lot that we can actually tell about fetal health while the fetus is still inside of the womb. And then fetal sex determinations is something that many people will choose to, um, to engage in. You can do this early on with blood samples. Many people, they wait until this ultrasound time a little bit later in the pregnancy. And I think we have, I think that's our last topic there. Yep. So um, infertility reproductive technology. So when we talk in chapter three, it makes it sound many times like, oh, you just, you know, the sperm and the egg meet through sexual intercourse, you get pregnant, and you just go on and have a baby. And that's the way it makes it sound. But um, it, many times it's, it's more complicated than that. So it's not always a simple, you know, sperm egg baby story. Um, so if you have um, infertility, a diagnosis there is an inability to conceive after 12 months of trying. If you are um, an older person who's trying to conceive, then uh, many times will give you a shorter window, like six months. Um, and so something that people might consider then is IVF. There are a lot of ways that science can help people to um, conceive who would like to do so and are having, having issues being able to do so. Um, but IVF is one that many people have heard of. With this, you've got the egg and the sperm combined externally and then transferred manually into the uterus. Um, this success really depends a lot on the mom's age. So we can see um, this pregnancy and live birth rate um, you know, very much, you know, reasonably strong chance. I don't want to say very much, but, you know, 40, 30%. And then once we get to about 30, maybe six or so, we kind of like drop off a lot. And then 46, we're not really seeing a um, huge success rate there from being able to transfer through IVF. And so um, there are a lot of different ways to try to help someone, 
you know, um, conceive if they choose to do so, but we do have to take into consideration factors like age and, and other factors that we will get to talk a little bit more about in um, chapter three. So that brings us to the end of our biological beginnings chapter. I look forward to talking with you more about pregnancy and birth.